All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and, and get started now. Thank you very much for attending today's webinar on, on Inco terms. As you guys know, this is a super important uh, topic. You may remember the last uh, month and a half, maybe it's been two months now, uh, there was a ship in the Suez Canal that got uh, stuck uh, and was stuck for several days and it backed up uh, hundreds of ships that were trying to come through there. And it was just a real debacle, but it was a, uh, in particular a debacle for the people who had uh, shipments on that ship because of the rules uh, that pertain to stuff being carried on those ships. Um, people who actually have shipments are the ones that are going to bear the cost uh, in many cases for the problems that are experienced by, by the ship. And in addition to that, just the fact that it was delayed for a super long time. I think the uh, ship was not released uh, until like 30 days after it actually got unstuck. And so lots and lots of problems and, uh, you know, who's going to pay and all of that. Uh, millions of dollars, I think hundreds of millions of dollars were involved uh, in terms of just the fees and whatnot. In any case, it's super important to, to know uh, your INCO terms and that you know what you're doing when uh, you're going to either receive something or send something. And it could be the difference between being profitable and just being a financial disaster. So, uh, Ms. Heidi, if you'll go to the next slide. Just want to let you guys know that uh, the kind of housekeeping sort of stuff to make sure that you're, you have a good experience. And also do want to make sure that you know that you are able to uh, enter questions into the question section, and um, we will cover them as as uh, appropriate. Uh, th this webinar is being uh, sponsored by the Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions Department, which is a department within the Arkansas Economic Development Commission. Its mission is to assist manufacturers to maximize enterprise value by assisting them with innovation, operational excellence, sustainability, and leadership development. Uh, we're part of also the Arkansas District Export Council and the uh, RDEC, as we put it, is putting on these uh, series of webinars on behalf of the Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions. Uh, there, we are one of the 60 DECs throughout the United States and we're charged with encouraging and supporting the export of goods and services that will strengthen individual companies stimulate US, uh, U.S. economic growth, and more importantly, great jobs. <clears throat> and with that, we're going to go to Ashven, who's going to do our today's speaker. Thank you, Rudy. I'm pleased to introduce our esteemed speaker today, uh, Mr. Graham Catlett. Mr. Catlett assists clients in developing commercial, legal, and political strategies for their growth into domestic and international markets. He works with select private clients on developing strategic business plans for growth, conducting due diligence review of proposed projects and partners, practical assistance on opening and staffing local offices, and developing sources of project finance. His business has conducted food distribution in Russia, develop medical technology and manage commercial real estate. Born in Little Rock, Mr. Catlett attended public school and graduated from the University of Arkansas bachelor, with a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration in 74 and Juris Doctor in 1977. Mr. Catlett is the managing partner of the Catlett Law Firm which was founded in 1977. Mr. Catlett is a member of Amer American Bar Association and American Institute of CPA. He's licensed to practice law in Arkansas and Missouri. Mr. Catlett is the past chairman of Arkansas District Export Council, a former member of Arkansas Economic Development Council, and is a consulting attorney for Mexican Consulate in Little Rock, Arkansas. Mr. Catlett has been active in many charitable organizations and political affairs for many years and is a frequent speaker on business, legal, and political issues, not only in the U.S., but in various other countries. I'm proud to present my good friend, Graham Catlett.
Thank you, Ashvin. It is a pleasure to be with you today to talk about a topic that I think uh, we all know a little bit about. And hopefully at the end of this uh, uh, seminar, we'll know much more about, and perhaps we'll even be able to determine where uh, to look up answers for those that we don't know. Let me ask first, uh, Heidi, can you see my screen? Okay, good. INCO terms are developed by an organization called the International Chamber of Commerce, and they're periodically reviewed and, and changed, the last one being 2020. But the INCO terms are things that we probably have heard in our business, but we <clears throat> may not know the extent to which they're useful. So that's what I want to talk about with you today. Before I do so, let me give you a couple of tools to use uh, either during this discussion or, or afterwards. The first is a free app that you can obtain from the Apple Store or the Google Store, and it is called Incoterms, and it will list, uh, uh, you can download on your phone the principal uh, slides that I'll be using today to help remind you about some of the aspects of the INCO terms. The second tool is this book that is published by the International Chamber of Commerce. And I recommend for those of you who use INCO terms regularly, you obtain this book because it will have a lot of the details about each of the INCO terms that we'll talk about today and, and many that we will not talk about. First, let's talk about what we're gonna cover. Okay. Uh, Graham, if you can yep. go ahead and go to the to the slide presentation, individual slides, right now you have the whole thing showing. So you do have to go okay. down at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Really, I don't know where that is. And down at the bottom and right hand side, there you see a little a screen, like movie screen down at the bottom right hand side of your PowerPoint. All right. Okay. Well it doesn't look like it's happening. No, I I'm sorry, okay. I still don't no see worries. it. No worries. Screen. Okay. All right, so the topics that I wanna talk with you about today are what the INCO term rules do and what they do not do and how best to incorporate the INCO term rules into your contracts. Then we'll talk about the 11 INCO terms, the order within the rules and the differences between the INCO terms 2010 and and 2020. So let's still talk about a few of the general operating rules. The rules provide three bits of information for you. First, they set out the obligations between the buyer and the seller. They provide who has the risk in other words, when is delivery? And third, which party pays which costs? Now keep in mind, these INCO terms are not a contract of sale. The way they operate is they can be incorporated into your contract of sale, but they do not alone constitute a contract of sale. They also do not provide specifications of the goods. They do not provide for the terms of payment, remedies for breach, consequences of delay, the effect of sanctions, imposition of tariffs, export or import prohibitions, force majeure, 
intellectual property rights or dispute resolution. So to have a comprehensive contract regarding trade, these are issues that need to be covered even though you also use incoterms. Incoterms most common misuse is in people thinking that they are simply for pricing. In other words, a buyer may ask a seller, give me your CIF price or give me your XWorks price. Well, we'll find that there's a lot more details that go in to using those terms than just for pricing. When you want to incorporate the INCO terms into your contract, the best way to do it is to use the first, the chosen INCO term rule, then a named port, place, or point, and then provide for INCO terms 2020. For example, CFI. Shanghai Inco Terms 2020 is a complete and proper use of Inco Terms. Now, there are definitions that are implied in the Inco Terms that you should be familiar with, and the first has to do with place. What does place mean? and what place is to be put in the INCO term. <clears throat> and here are the, the rules. In all the rules except the C rules, the place indicates where the goods are delivered. In the D rules, the place is delivery and destination, and it's the same place. In C, rules, the place is destination, but not delivery. Now that seems complicated, but when we get into the rules, you'll see how they apply. So what is this delivery? Well, delivery is the place where the risk shifts from the seller to the buyer. And that is very important, and it is often misunderstood when we use INCO terms, because even though insurance may be provided, the party that has the risk is the one who has to make the claim for the insurance. And so there is a difference. Now the extremes for delivery are X works, that's the closest to the seller, and sellers usually prefer to use X works for that reason. The buyer, on the other hand, prefers DDP because that does not shift the risk to the buyer until all the requirements of DDP are satisfied. Now you'll say, well, I'm a seller, so I'm always gonna use X works. Well, sometimes that's not practical because your buyer won't allow you to use X works, and, and that's an issue then that has to be negotiated. Now, when we talk about a place, keep in mind that there are many places within a port or even within a city. And so it is important when possible to identify a particular point within the city or within the port for delivery. If the uh, terms do not specify a point, then you'll see in a minute how INCO terms gives discretion to either the seller or the buyer about choosing that point. It also gets a little more complicated if there are multiple carriers. 
The question is, where does delivery occur when there are multiple carriers under CPT and CIP? So that's something you have to think through when you're developing the terms that you want. Now, there are seven INCO terms that can be applied for any mode of transportation. There are four more which only apply for sea and inland waterway transport. But let's take a look at these seven first because these are the most common and they can be used both for inland and ocean freight. The first is X Works. The second is Free Carrier. Then Carriage Paid To. Then Carriage and Insurance Paid To. Delivered at Place. Delivered at a Place Unloaded. And Delivered Duty Paid. Now, Often, all we know about INCO terms are those phrases, but you'll see that there's more that is incorporated into those phrases when we use them. Now, the other four rules for sea and inland waterway transport are FAS, which is free alongside the ship, FOB, free on board, CFR, the cost in freight, and CIF, cost insurance and in freight. Now we start getting into the weeds because with each of those INCO terms, there are all these categories of issues that are incorporated into your contract. And this is what we need to understand and be able to find before we enter into a contract with INCO terms, because some of these details may be different from what we expect or what we want. For each of the, the INCO terms, there is a detailed list of sellers' obligations and buyers obligations. You see they're broken down into general obligations, taking delivery, transfer of risks, carriage, insurance, the delivery transport document, or in the case of the buyer, proof of delivery, export and import clearance, checking, packaging, marketing, allocation of costs and notices. So not to be too re repetitious, but when you use an INCO term, all of these topics and the details within them will be incorporated into your contract. So it is important that you understand these details so that you're not agreeing to something you don't want. And my final general topic is about trademark. It is not necessary to use the R with a circle around it in incorporating the term into your sales contract, but it is necessary to use the year of the INCO terms because as I mentioned, they change. Uh, about every 10 years. Previously, we had INCO terms 2010 and effective January 1st of 2020. We now use INCO terms 2020, and there is a difference. All right, now let's go into the details of each one. And what I want to do is I'll talk about each of the 11 and describe how the graphic explains the principal terms, but only for X works will I actually 
discuss the details of all of the articles because first it will be totally boring if I do it for all 11, but also you can find those as well as I can by referring to the book that I mentioned previously because the International Chamber of Commerce writes all those details in that book. But the neat part of this, let me see if I can get rid of this. is the way these graphics are directed. And I hope you can see this. First to the left in blue, you have the seller and to the right in yellow is the buyer. And the different obligations are color coded based on that key. So for instance, the X works inco term reflects that the product is at the sellers on not loaded into the transport the costs of the seller end when the goods are made available for the buyer at the X works point and the risks shift from the seller to the buyer at this particular point. So from the graphic, you can see that it is the buyer's duty to assume all costs and risks from this point at the seller's location unloaded or before it's loaded in the transport and all further costs and all risks until it goes to the buyer are assumed by the buyer let's see how that works in detail so under general obligations the seller must provide the goods and the commercial invoice in conformity that may be required by the contract. Any document to be provided by the seller may be in paper or electronic form as agreed, or if there is no agreement, as is customary. The general obligation of the buyer is to pay the price of the goods as provided in the contract. Any document to be provided by the buyer may be in paper or electronic form as agreed or when there is no agreed as is customary. The second point is delivery. The seller must deliver the goods by placing them at the disposal of the buyer at the agreed point, point, if any, at the named place of delivery. And if there are several points available, the seller may select the point that best suits its purpose. The seller must deliver the goods on the agreed date or within the agreed period. So you see this incorporates some issues that we don't think about when we just use X works sellers plant. It first gives the, uh, the seller the right to select the point within the seller's plant or facility that best suits the seller's purpose. The buyer's obligation for delivery, the buyer must take delivery of the goods when they have been delivered and when notice has been given, which we'll get to in just a second. The next category of issues is carriage. The seller has, and we're, again, we're talking about X works. The seller has no obligation to the buyer to make a contract of carriage. However, the seller must provide the buyer 
at the buyer's request, risk, and cost with any information in possession of the seller, including transport-related security requirements that the buyer needs for arranging carriage. So you might think under X Works, all you have to do is have the goods available on your dock, and that's not true. You have the buyer, I mean, the seller has no obligation to make a contract of carriage. However, if the buyer requests, then the seller must provide any information in its possession that the buyer needs for arranging carriage, but it's at the buyer's cost. So you can charge the buyer for it. Buyer's duty on carriage is up to the buyer to contract or arrange its own cost for the carriage from the name place of delivery. I think that's clear. Transfer of risks. The seller bears all risks of loss until they have been delivered with the exception of loss or damage under B3. And B3 says that the buyer bears all risk of loss to the goods once they have been delivered. If the buyer fails to give notice, then the buyer bears all risk of loss or damage from the agreed date or the end of the agreed period for delivery, provided that the goods have been clearly identified as a contract good. So if the buyer does not give notice as to when it plans to pick up the goods, then the buyer will have all risk of loss from the agreed date or the end of the agreed period for delivery if the seller has identified them. If they're fungible goods and they have not been identified, then there's no uh, loss until the buyer actually takes possession. Insurance. Seller has no obligation to the buyer to make a contract of insurance, but again, the seller must provide to the buyer at the buyer's risk and cost information that the buyer needs for insurance. Delivery, seller has no obligation to the buyer, but the buyer must provide the seller appropriate evidence of having taken delivery. Export clearance, once again, we may think that the seller has no duties, but there are some duties. The seller must assist the buyer at the buyer's request, risk, and cost in obtaining documents or information related to export, transit, import formalities required by the countries, such as export licenses, security, uh, clearances, or any other official authorization. Checking, packing, and marking. The seller must pay the costs of those checking operations, such as checking quality, measuring, weighting, and counting that are necessary for purpose of delivering the goods in accordance with the contract. So if, if the contract calls for a certain quantity, then the seller must make sure that it is delivering that quantity and it is up to the seller to pay the costs of checking the quality, measuring, weighting, and counting. The seller must also package the goods and mark the goods in a manner appropriate for their transport unless the parties have agreed otherwise. Allocation of costs. The seller must pay all costs relating to the goods until they've been delivered. And then for the buyer, the buyer pays the costs, reimburse the costs that we mentioned before that if the buyer requests services of the seller, then the buyer must pay for them. The buyer pays all duties, taxes, charges, and so forth and pays any additional costs incurred by failing to take delivery of the goods when they've been placed at the disposal or to give appropriate notice. 
Number 10, it is the seller's duty to give the buyer notice so that the buyer can take delivery of the goods and the buyer must, whenever it is agreed that the buyer is entitled to determine the time within an agreed period or the point, also give the seller sufficient notice. So as you can imagine, for each of the INCO terms, these specifics will change. And that's why it's important for you to understand the organization of INCO terms and that all these all additional terms are being added in and incorporated into your contract when you just use those simple abbreviations. I'm going to go through the rest of the INCO terms, but without getting into all those details, because as I say, you can look those up as well as have me read them to you. But I will talk about each of the uh, graphics because they'll give you a difference and show you or depict a difference among the different INCO terms. And the next one I want to talk about is free carry. <clears throat> Remember in X Works, the product was not on the truck. It was on the ground outside the truck. So the difference with free carrier is that the seller has the duty to load the products. And you'll see the seller's risks continue until the product is loaded on the truck. But from that point, until the product reaches the buyer, all costs and all risks are with the buyer. Now, there is an alternative uh, depiction for FCA, and that is when the seller's duty is to deliver it to a point not at the seller's location, but at some intermediate point, or perhaps a warehouse to go to be transported to a different method of transportation. In that case, it's still FCA, but the seller's costs are up to the delivery at that point, that intermediary point, loaded. The seller does not have to load it, unload it. And the risks of the seller continue until the product reaches that intermediate point without a duty to unload it. So you see the difference between FCA and X Works. Now, another big difference is when you reach or use the term CPT. And in this case, and the title carriage paid to kind of gives you a hint, the seller's duty is to pay the costs up to the point of the buyer. It, the seller does not have a duty to unload the products, but the seller has to provide transportation. Interestingly, the risks, however, shift back at the point of the seller's loading. In other words, the buyer assumes the risks from the point of loading until the product reaches the buyer's point. So what that means is that the seller in its price will include transport costs, but will not include insurance costs. There's no duty on the seller to provide insurance. 
the buyer must obtain its own insurance and have this risk shift at the seller's location. Now, let's talk about place because we were just talking about two different places. We were talking about the point at which the seller must make uh, or pay the transport. And we're also talking about a different point, which is where the risks shift. And so you see in CPT, there is a difference between delivery and destination. We previously defined delivery as the point at which risks shift. And so the delivery point is, is here at the seller's location. But the destination is not where the goods were delivered, but the destination is at the buyer's location. So that's why delivery and destination must be clear in your agreement. All right, let's change it a little bit. <clears throat> let's go to CIP. It's similar to CPT, but you'll see a difference is that we have a line for insurance. So in this case, the seller is providing costs of transport to the buyer's location, the risk and delivery occurs at the seller's location and the buyer assumes all risks until the product reaches the buyer. However, the seller's cost must include insurance. Now, if there is a loss, if the truck is damaged or the goods are damaged somewhere during transport, then the goods will be insured, but who has to make the claim in the insurance? Well, it would be the buyer because the buyer has the risk of loss during this transport period. So, so even though the seller is paying for the insurance, he's actually insuring the goods in the name of the buyer, because if there is a damage to the goods after this point, the seller has no responsibility. The seller merely has responsibility for obtaining the proper kind of insurance. So that leads to the question of what kind of insurance? Well, there are generally a couple of types of insurance. And I think we're all familiar with both um, all risk insurance and specified peril insurance. And that's one of the differences that we've had a change in, in uh, Inco terms 2020. Previously, under Inco terms 2010, both CIF and CIP provided for the Marine uh, Institute cargo clauses of the of Lloyd's clause C, which is specified perils. But now they've changed for CIP to require all risk insurance. So the seller <clears throat> has to provide all risk insurance when the term is CIP, but otherwise the insurance can be clause C, which is just specified peril. 
as I say, there are all these rules and details, but any of these can be changed by the contract between the buyer and seller. What I'm talking about now are those instances in which there is no change and we're relying on the incorporated terms from INCO terms. <clears throat> the next term is DAP, delivered at place. And you see, this is vastly different from the other ones. Here, not only does the seller have to pay the cost of transport, but the seller also has the risks of transport. The product is not, it is unloaded, but the risk is the primary difference here. And so if you are a buyer, you will want DAP. If you're a seller, then you may want CIP. Now let's talk about the differences a little bit. <clears throat> If you're a buyer, the price is going to be the same between DAP and CIP. And if you're a seller, your costs are going to be the same. In both instances, the seller is going to pay the cost of transport. And in both instances, the seller will have, well, will want to have insurance. If the seller uses DAP, then the seller will want insurance for his own, I mean, CIP, he'll want it uh, uh, for his own purposes to protect him. If he uses DAP, then he must provide insurance. So, <clears throat> so the costs are the same, but there is a difference because if there is a damage to the property, to the products, then who has to bear the risk and recover the money from the insurance? Well, you see here, it is the duty of the uh, seller. And under CIP, it is the duty of the buyer. So depending on who you are, there is a difference between DAP and CIP. And to repeat it one more time, if you're the seller, you will prefer CIP. If you're the buyer, you will prefer DAP. Another term is delivered at place unloaded DPU. And you'll see that's very similar to DAP, except DAP was unloaded, I mean, was loaded, and so DPU will be unloaded. Finally, the delivered duty pay DDP, the seller has tremendous responsibility, not just in paying the, the costs of transport and assuming the risk, but the seller, you see, has all export formalities and import formalities because they've got to get it through customs. If you're the buyer, that's what you want. If you're the seller, you certainly want to be cautious before you agree to it. Now, there are four other rules that only apply to uh, ocean and inland water freight. The first is FAS, and you see from the graphic, uh, the costs and risks uh, shift when the seller delivers the goods to the side of the ship ready for loading, but all further costs of transport and all risks from this point are the responsibility of the buyer. FOB is similar, except 
the goods must be loaded onto the ship before the seller's costs or risks are ended. CFR, the costs of the seller include transport, but the risks end when the products are loaded onto the ship at the seller's terminal. Then we have CIF, where the costs of the seller include uh, transport, but not unloading. The risks stop at the point of loading, but the seller is responsible for buying insurance. And again, it's, it's um, going to be for the benefit of the buyer um, under CIF. Now, so now you know all about the 11 INCO terms, or at least where to look them up. There were a few changes from 2010 to 2020. They changed the name from DAT to DPU. There's a difference in the insurance that I mentioned. The rule book is more specific. They added some more technical rules and they developed these slides and, and graphics that are, I think, helpful. And as I would recommend to you, buy the book and also get the, um, uh, the app from, for your phone. But that's not all. There are a couple of other issues that you should be familiar with. We sometimes see FOB Fayetteville, Arkansas, as opposed to FOB New Orleans, Inco Terms 2020. Now, what's the difference? Well, we know that the second one is the proper way to incorporate the FOB term and all those details into your contract. But what's this if you don't incorporate it? What does that mean and why do we still see that used? Well, there are several terms that are in the law, the Uniform Commercial Code as we adopted it in Arkansas, and you can use those terms, they have different definitions than INCO terms, but still you see people use them without incorporating all those terms from INCO terms. I wouldn't recommend it because the definition of these terms under the Uniform Commercial Code is not nearly as comprehensive as it is under INCO terms. So I recommend that you use the full INCO terms. So now I think you can relax. Hopefully I've not bored you too much and you understand at least where to go look up the answers when you have them. And I'm happy now to take any easy questions you may have. And by the way, by the book. Graham, at this point, it doesn't seem like we have any additional questions. There were some questions about whether we were going to uh, send out a recording and uh, we had problems with people not being able to download we will be sending both the uh, the presentation, the record presentation, as well any, as any handouts, um, probably within 48 hours, if, if not sooner. But uh, you know, as as you guys can see now, there's a lot more to this topic than just saying, well, it's FOB. Uh, there's lots and lots of nuances, and un unfortunately, as they say, the devil's in the details, right? And um, if you don't know the, the details it can wind up really costing you uh, all your profit and, and more. 
And so while this topic is, you know, not a, a fun topic, I guess you could say, it's a vitally important topic uh, that uh, you really need to understand all the details, all the nuances to make sure that you're making the, the right choices that will uh, provide you what, what you're looking for, what you're hoping to end up with. In any case, um, if there are any uh, questions at this point, we're, we're happy to take them. But at this point, I don't, um, I don't see, I don't see any questions. Well, it's been a pleasure being part of your seminar, and and uh, I wish you good luck. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, as always, the Arkansas Economic Development Commission and the Arkansas District Export Council are here to be able to help you with any uh, training needs and information that you need on exporting. And uh, we'll be having other webinars as time goes along, probably in another four or five weeks on, on various export-related topics. Uh, Ashvin and Graham, thank you so much for, for your time and for your uh, knowledge that you have to uh, to share oh, hang on a second here uh i do actually see let me see uh just a comment uh inc incredibly valuable presentation uh if you can send the powerpoint copies immediately fantastic anyway so uh, i hope that you guys really got something out of this presentation and uh, once again if you have any questions you can also call me at 501-749 seven four eight four which is my cell number and i'll be happy to an answer any questions that you might have once again my phone number is 501-749-7484 and i can put you in contact uh, with um, graham uh, if needed thank you again and have a great day